generation from the original German settler, uh, Johann Jakob Richter, who became John Jacob Rector. Um, ten generations. A bark bench isn't a bad place to sleep if you have... Unless they take that too. And if you lose your job, run out of food, watch your family starve, you can always hop a freight train and go pick crops. If there are any crops. How could people survive 10 years of this? It was the Great Depression. The Great Depression had profound and permanent effects on every person who lived through it. The huge changes it brought were not just economic, they were also social, psychological, and political. The Depression came after a spectacular decade of high rolling in the 1920s. Poverty replaced riches like night after day. What caused the Depression? Could it have been prevented? How did people cope with the stunning 10-year loss of property, jobs, food, personal dignity? What do they remember about the disaster and what invisible scars do they still carry? After an almost impossible climb in the 1920s, the American stock market crashed with a thud heard all over the nation. It was October 29, 1929. Giants like RCA and Westinghouse lost nearly half their value in one short day. Just as they are now, the fortunes of every citizen and family were tied to business prosperity. Corporations losing huge profits slashed wages and hours and laid off workers. Suddenly, secure middle-class people couldn't make rent or mortgage and car payments or keep appliances bought on 1920s credit. Men and women slowly realized there were no other jobs. As the Depression stretched out, savings ran out. Some of the wealthy suffered losses, but at least they had money to lose. They primarily felt sorry and embarrassed for friends who had lost everything, including dignity. A common lament was, my father lost everything in the Depression. People lost jobs and never dreamed they'd lose jobs when the Depression hit. The Depression struck America, a certain part of America, agricultural America, long before the stock market crashed. We always date the Depression the date of the stock market crash. That back October day, we call it, 1929. The farmers had a terrible time before that. But immediate reaction, what will I do? And then that terrible feeling of lack fall of self-esteem. It's my fault. See, that's the terrible legacy of the Great Depression of the 30s. People did not question the system. Maybe something was wrong. They questioned themselves. Because all our lives we've been taught from day one, by God, if you work hard, you can make it. And only lazy people don't have jobs. They found out, I'm not lazy. I work hard, and I have no job. Even though the value of all income-producing goods and services fell by one-third, President Hoover insisted that the economy would right itself if it were left alone. His political and personal philosophy caused him to stubbornly refuse all requests for any direct federal government relief to individuals. People of every type and former income took paper routes, shined shoes, and sold apples and pencils on street corners. Jury duty drew huge crowds just because it paid. Colleges and universities graduated thousands with little hope of good jobs. Breadwinners dreaded meeting the bread lines. Children endured hunger and stress beyond their years. One young man wrote, Travis and son shut down. And for six months, dad didn't draw a penny. For a whole week one time, he didn't have anything to eat but potatoes. For people already poor, life got a whole lot worse. Some lived in lean-tos made of scrap wood, cardboard, or tin. They warmed themselves over fires in garbage cans and waited outside restaurants for food scraps.
but they knew how to survive. Stay in bed in cold weather, patch your shoes with tire rubber, and eat anything edible. Anything. Along with their other miseries, African Americans were inevitably the last to be hired and first to be fired. The Negro was born in depression. It didn't mean much to him. The Great Depression, as you called it, there was no such thing. The best he could be is a janitor, a porter, a shoeshine boy. It only became official when it hit the white man. Otherwise, they could go to the store and get a bag of beans or a sack of flour and a piece of fat meat, and they would cook it, and we would eat it. Now, you take the white fella. He couldn't do this. His wife would tell him, look, if you can't do any better than this, I'm going to leave you. I seen it happen. He couldn't stand bringing home beans instead of steak and capons. Farm prices had collapsed even earlier during the 1920s. In the Depression, when sheriffs came to foreclose on farms, they often met enraged neighboring farmers with guns and pitchforks, refusing to let them take a friend's land. Farmers would threaten buyers, force down the sale of a farm to as little as a dollar, and lease it back to the grateful original owner. Surpluses of cotton, corn, wheat, and tobacco rotted in the field. There were no buyers. A two-fisted rancher who had lost his land and herd of fine Hereford cattle told an Oklahoma journalist, I mortgaged my land, and today I'm cleaned out. By God, I am not going to stand for it. Women and men felt their hopes and dreams of the future slip sadly away. Prosperous small towns faded into shadows of themselves as people left for what they hoped would be luck somewhere else. The country became a mirror of empty gloom. What caused the tragic suffering and disintegration of such a robust nation? Why did the Great Depression happen? In the early 1920s, the Republican administrations of Harding and Coolidge gave business unrestrained freedom. As a result, unregulated business created an amazing economic boom. The value of stocks zoomed upward. Huge numbers of Americans, both wealthy traditional stockholders and the middle class, spotted a chance to get easy money. Banks and corporations saw it too. In examples such as RCA's rise from two and a half dollars a share in 1921, to an unbelievable $420 a share in 1928. Excited corporate managers created new types of stock to meet the public demand. Stock brokers began manipulating the market to tease up their own stock investments. Banks and brokers got into risky, unsecured loans in which people with no money would borrow money and invest it in stock. Assuming in time the stock would go so high they could pay back the bank and take their profit. The banks saw their own profit potential and began investing their money in stocks, throwing in their depositors' funds, too. Meanwhile, the consumer binge of the wealthy and upper middle classes in the 1920s didn't touch the common people who didn't earn enough money to spend on luxuries. To keep the boom booming, lower-income Americans would have to make higher wages so that they, too, could buy more expensive products. In addition, products had a limited market. Most middle-class people bought only one car or house on credit, so business became overstocked with unsold goods. The economy obviously had problems that went unrecognized or ignored. Republican President Herbert Hoover, just a little over a year before the beginning of the Great Depression, said, We in America today are nearer to the final triumph over poverty than ever before in the history of the land. By the late 1920s, the boom slowed down. Overseas demand for American products was declining. Europe, particularly Germany, had long been in serious economic trouble. Some European countries defaulted on loans. With their own and customers' money in the stock market, foreign banks were overextended. American banks, already weakened, were now overextended too. The signs of coming disaster were clearly visible. Looking back, we wonder why economic experts didn't spot the house of cards they were dealing themselves and the country. Why did government and business do nothing to prevent collapse? Were any laws enforced against business that might have helped us? Why did no one see the Great Depression coming?
think the major reason was that they were too close to the economic conditions that brought about the crash in the 1920s. In, in other words, they couldn't really see the forest for the trees. The decade was one of, of superficial prosperity at one level, and these businessmen, by and large, believed that that prosperity was more widespread and more, I think, um, uh, significant than it turned out to be. There was great inequities in the American economic system in the 1920s, and because they were so close to the, su the prosperity of that decade, they couldn't see the weaknesses underneath the prosperity as well as we can see them now. And I don't think there was anything inherent in the economy that led either to the crash or to the depression. But there were weaknesses in the way we regulated our security markets. There was a speculative binge in 28 and 29, creating a situation by the summer of 1929. I don't think that there's any way to avoid a crash of some sort. What had gone up so high had to come down, and there were no good regulation in the system that could bring it down easily. In that sense, I would say that the crash became almost inevitable by the summer of 1929. We'd never had a depression like this, and, and its genesis really wasn't very well understood. It wasn't indeed until uh, late in the 1930s when the Englishman, John Maynard Keynes, uh, wrote a very famous book that we began to get a kind of glimmer about, about why the thing turned out to be so disastrously, uh, so dangerously deep and steep a decline. In 1929, Wall Street laid an egg. It cracked and the economy crashed. A lot of people lost a lot of money. Banks were stripped of money and reputation as fortresses of safety. First, they lost the money they had invested. Then they lost their depositors' funds. When customers went to withdraw savings, the money was gone. People lost so much money they could buy only essentials. The rich cut back, spending far less on luxuries. As a result, demand for products and services plummeted. Because the wealthy were also the business people, they made both personal and business belt-tightening decisions, cutting back expenses and laying many workers off. Those workers who lost jobs also lost savings, and they cut back painfully. Together, the blue-collar workers and middle class spent only for food, housing, and fuel. The poor became destitute. Marketplace demand dropped more. America began an awful spiral as income fell, consumption fell. Business cut back. Less money circulated. Demand dropped further. Foreign demand evaporated as Europe also fell into depression. Cause, effect, cause, effect. The downward spiral became a whirlpool in which America drowned. There are two spirals. One's the financial spiral, and one's the real spiral. Financial spiral, I mean the stock market going down like a flight of stairs each day, lower and lower, and banks collapsing one after the other. And the real spiral, people, people losing their jobs, and production itself getting smaller and smaller. There probably wasn't anything that could have been done in 1929 about the financial spiral, because the, the, the controls were not in place. That is, the regulations for the Federal Reserve, the, the degree of regulation of the banks, uh, the, the capacity the legal capacity of the government to interfere in the workings of the financial world was simply not in place. Once the confidence in the stock market uh, was lost, it triggered then a lack of confidence throughout not only the domestic economy, but the international economy as well. And to a large degree, economies are based on confidence. And the, the crash then triggered a lack of confidence at all levels in the economy. So initially, these leaders could not have done anything to stop that trigger reaction. Ultimately, we don't even come out of the Great Depression until the Second World War. The reason that government could not do very much is partly ignorance. They did not know what to do. Older remedies did not work, but it's also leverage. The amount of federal spending was so small as a percentage of the total budget that it would have been un inconceivable that they could have either used the type of taxing policy or spending policy that would have arrested such a sharp downturn. No politician would have been open to such major government inter intervention. Economists speculated all day long about the whys and wherefores of the Great Depression, but most people knew only that they were hurting. However, a spirit of charity developed toward those even worse off than oneself. Together, neighbors talked and shared what they had, wondered what could be done, and when the hard times would end. Many had nothing to share. One-fourth of all American workers were without jobs. 
Hopeless, unemployed men, helpless to provide for their families, left their loved ones behind, possibly to better fates, or took them along and caught endless freight trains. In empty lots and under bridges, they sarcastically called their packing crate colonies Hoovervilles. A Hoover blanket was newspaper to sleep under. Hoover flags were empty pockets turned inside up. But the vagabond life helped with loneliness. One black man who lived this way said, Black and white, it didn't make any difference who you were. Because everybody was poor. We used to take a big pot and cook food, cabbage, meat, and beans all together. 25 or 30 would be out on the side of the rail. They were dirty. They had overalls on. They didn't have no food. They didn't have anything. Several geographic areas were devastated. The miners of Kentucky, West Virginia, and other coal-producing areas were so poor that starving new mothers could not produce milk. Their babies drank flour and water. Mine owners fought union pressure, cutting wages and hours to the bare bone. Many in this back country ate roots, weeds, and flowers to survive. Radical change occurred in the farmland of southern Oklahoma and surrounding states. Throughout the entire 1930s, it suffered such severe drought and dust storms it was as if God himself had deserted the earth. The migrants who left this infamous dust bowl were called Okies. They piled into rattle trap cars, rode mules, hitched or walked to California's rich Imperial Valley, where, rumor had it, there was work. But work proved to be part-time. Faced with near impossibilities, people kept up morale by pitching in and coping as best they could. Day workers took in day sleepers. People planted, raised, or traded for much of the food they ate. Teachers fed students out of their own meager salaries or pantries. People began turning disadvantages into advantages. Older Americans who lived through the Great Depression have vivid memories of the devastation that happened in their lives over 50 years ago. Children come down and play with us, and they'd tell us they're hungry, so we'd tell our mother, and she'd give up some canned goods and things and send them. We raised big gardens and canned everything we could. We, we never did go hungry, but I saw families that did. We had a rather large house, so we took a boarder, a lady with a little girl, and we furnished her meals and kept the little girl after school. I carpentered, I'm a mechanic, and I worked on the farm. I've cut wood and sell it. You know, just any, anything that I could find if I didn't have nothing to do. To raise their spirits, people played bridge and canasta, listened to the radio, and visited each other's homes. When they did go out for the evening, it was usually to the movies. New York Mayor Jimmy Walker asked Hollywood to film comedies, and five-cent movies were as fluffy as real life was drab. Humorist Will Rogers said, We are the first nation in history to go to the poorhouse in an automobile. When people couldn't cope, there was an increasingly violent, almost revolutionary mood. Enraged farmers dumped huge quantities of fresh milk. They blocked highways, smashed windshields and headlights, and punctured tires with pitchforks, taking it in their own hands to keep farm produce off the market and gain prices equal to the cost of production. President Hoover did provide limited assistance to business and farmers. He shored up weak banks and insurance companies and sponsored a few isolated public work projects such as Boulder Dam, but he was unwilling to help individuals directly with federal funds. It's curious that people do uh, view Hoover as a person who did not respond to the Great Depression at all, and I think this is an undeserved uh, historical reputation that he has. If anything, he was the first president to respond to a national uh, depression to a financial crisis and he responded very quickly after the October 1929 crash by calling in business leaders and organizing them into a business uh, survey conference to try to make sure that uh, wages were not cut and that production remained high. He took a number of actions both uh, in 1929 and 1930 that we have tended to forget because none of the actions was enough to stem the tide of uh, the declining market and the declining economy. So that it isn't that he didn't respond, it's that his actions were moderate 
and even the major structural changes, like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation or the Federal Farm Bureau, which he established, they didn't do enough, quickly enough, in terms of what the public felt should have been done. So that his limitation then was not his uh, a conservative economic outlook, which he did not have. His ultimate limitation was that he had a philosophy, a political philosophy, which prevented him from taking the popular kind of action that was later taken during the New Deal to give direct relief to individuals. Whatever political hope Hoover had was lost in the Bonus Army incident. In June 1932, over 20,000 World War I veterans, some accompanied by families, marched on Washington. Their request was the early payment of pensions promised them by 1945. Congress rejected their request and many left. But some of the men moved into shabby huts along the Potomac mud banks and into vacant government buildings. The Hoover administration was concerned about possible subversive activities. The government responded with mounted federal troops led by General Douglas MacArthur. He moved to dislodge the veterans and burn the shacks. Tear gas made babies vomit. American bayonets stabbed American veterans. Hoover hadn't intended this, nor had he directly ordered the troops, but the entire country was electrified by such a miserable event. Many people blamed him. Then they chose America's traditional peaceful route to change the electoral process. After nearly four years of economic hard times and the Bonus Army incident, Herbert Hoover's political future was crushed. His personal philosophy came to the fore and made him appear very rigid, very heartless and unconcerning. When internally we know he suffered very much from the Depression and personally did uh, relate to people who were suffering during that time. But he couldn't convey that publicly once his defensive personality came to the fore and was portrayed in, in really offensive ways to the public. He made just disastrous statements as president. Uh, that the Depression was over, that people who sold apples on the street corner uh, really wanted to be selling apples on the street corner, so that he couldn't have had a worse press during the Depression. But up to that point, it should be remembered that he had the most favorable press probably of any public figure in the 1920s. 1920s America was wildly prosperous. Many people invested in rising stocks, even borrowing money to buy more. But in 1929, the stock market crashed. The Great Depression was on. Companies cut workers and hours to survive. Banks went under. Many middle class and poor people lost everything they had. Homeless people wandered cross country for work, especially crop picking jobs. They lived in shack towns called Hoovervilles, sharing their poverty with others like them. But President Hoover would not provide direct federal help, saying that local charities and local governments should feed and care for the needy. But the magnitude of the depression overwhelmed local governments and charities. As the depression deepened, there was an occasional threat of violence. Farmers would greet sheriffs with pitchforks and shotguns when they came to foreclose on a neighbor's land. The nationwide dissatisfaction with Hoover's conservative philosophy came to a head when federal troops removed indigent veterans from empty Washington buildings and shacks at the point of a bayonet. It seems entirely possible that the American people might have forgiven most presidents almost anything in the Great Depression had they felt loved and cared for by a sensitive leader. There has always been a bravery and willingness in the American attitude of, we're all in this together. In some countries, a financial siege of so many years would lead to dictators. What kept Americans from doing the same thing? I think, for one thing, they were stunned. They didn't know quite what to do. For another thing, that American dream, for some reason, was still with them. A dream that you, you can make it. It's, it's my opinion that the American people have never been terribly radical or revolutionary, not even during the American Revolution. We had one of the most moderate revolutions one can imagine. And consequently, our political system since that time has reflected moderation, generally speaking. So that to have anticipated uh, uh, the success of radicalism in the 1930s, even in the face of the Great Depression, would have been to anticipate a turn away from our entire history up to that time. We have tended as a people to take up moderate reform through the electoral process, 
rather than to take up radical reform, which often means taking to the streets or taking to demonstrations in one way or another. Middle-aged American men and women can see and feel the long-term effects of the depression in their parents and their grandparents. They are constant savers and bargain shoppers, critical voters and careful newspaper readers. They remember depression events that shattered them and triumphs that made them whole, and almost always they fear a future too much like their past. People who lived through that period have always said carried with them throughout their lives an indelible brand, depression made. It created anxieties and apprehensions about the economy. It creates guilt on my part even when I buy a Coca-Cola, a luxury like a Coca-Cola today. Uh, I have always been very frugal. There's always a bit of haunting anxiety that it all happened again, and I think people who lived through that generally suffered through it, and most suffered in the 30s. I think there, there's that type of psychological impact that's profound. The long-term effects of the Great Depression on our economy were to change it from a system that was essentially a private enterprise system with some small government auxiliary functions to a system that was essentially a mixed system. So we went into the Great Depression, a, uh, an economy of private business with a government whose function was law and order. We came out of the Great Depression, essentially a private enterprise system, with a government whose function was law, order, and economic security. In Studs Turkle's book, Hard Times, an African-American said, the powers that be missed the boat during the depression a farmer said when you took a man's horse and plow away you denied him food you just convicted his family to starvation it was just that real a woman said no one no one should experience a depression no child should while Hoover was swimming in disaster, a warm and winning Democrat was elected president of the United States. People said he had a miraculous quality. In his inaugural speech, he told an exhausted nation, The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. His name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he was to become the leader of the nation through the bitter nights of the Great Depression and the bloody days of World War II. The preceding telecourse was brought to you by East Central College, Jefferson College, Mineral Area College, St. Louis Community College, members of Missouri and Illinois Telecourse Cooperative. For a complete list of participating colleges in Missouri and Illinois, look up our website at www.mitco.org. Welcome to KETC 9 Store of Knowledge, your portal to a world of lifelong learning. The Gateway begins at our Galleria and Crestwood Plaza locations or online at www.storeofknowledge.com. You're watching KETC Channel 9, St. Louis. The following telecourse was brought to you by East Central College, Jefferson College, Mineral Area College, St. Louis Community College, members of Missouri and Illinois Telecourse Cooperative, 